All right. Okay. We are recording. So tonight we are going to be talking about astronomy of the East. Astronomy is one of the oldest branches of science. All known ancient, ancient civilizations were equally fascinated by the motion of the sun, moon, and stars, and made careful observations and recordings of these motions. Although the objects in the sky are the same, the stories are the, in the constellations that they came up with vary widely across cultures. Uh, in this talk, Naveen will be talking about such uh, some contributions from all the way from China to India. Um, Naveen, also being from India, will we'll talk a little bit about what he learned when he was growing up in India. Now, our speaker tonight is Dr. Naveen Vecha. He is an aerospace technologist at ERC Incorporated, supporting uh, the Jacobs ESSCA contract at NASA MSFC in Huntsville, Alabama. He supports NASA's Centennial Challenges program as a challenge challenge member. In his previous roles, he supported major NASA projects such as the Space Launch System and the James Webb Space Telescope. Devine has been an active member of VBOSS since 2013 and served on the VBOSS board in multiple positions, including VBOSS president during 2014 to 2015. Since 2016, he has been volunteering as NASA's JPL Solar System Ambassador in educating the general public about NASA's mission. Naveen received his MS and PhD degrees in mechanical engineering from University of California, Los Angeles, MTech in mechanical engineering from Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur, India, and BE in mechanical engineering from Osmania University in India. So everyone, please get a warm welcome to Dr. Naveen Vecha. He is going to start now. Hey, Michael, thank you. <clears throat> Hope you can all hear me well. So I'm able to share my screen uh, so I won't be seeing, I have only one screen, so I won't be seeing questions or what is going on <clears throat> in the chat and everything. So Michael will help me with that. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining tonight and thanks for the support. Uh, I see people from West Coast to East Coast and some from India too. So that's uh, really nice. Let me start uh, my screen share. Hope you all can see it. Move it to the presentation more. All right, uh, thanks for joining the talk. Uh, I'm Naveen Vecha. In this presentation, I'll talk about uh, some interesting contributions to astronomy from India and China, and then uh, share uh, some star lore. Star lore has a very long uh, history and has been practiced by every culture ever recorded. Uh, different cultures associate uh, the star patterns with different everyday things or animals or gods and created stories to pass on um, as a oral tradition and to explain religious uh, doctrines or actual events in history. Uh, we are not much different from uh, like our ancient uh, civilizations because we associated with, we associate like two dots and a parenthesis with smiley face. If you give it to a software, it might not recognize that as a face, right? But we have the capacity to recognize that as a face. All right, let me start by wishing you all a belated happy new year. I'm not talking about the new year that occurred four months ago. I'm talking about the numerous uh, regional new year celebrations that happened in India early this week. Like many traditional calendars uh, from various parts of the world, all the regional Indian calendars are lunisolar calendars. On uh, lunisolar uh, calendars, a date indicates the phase of the moon and the time of the solar year. If the solar year is a sidereal year, the calendar predicts the constellation near which the full moon occurs. Uh, 30 such uh, different regional variations of calendars exist in India and people from different regions follow these to celebrate festivals and perform various uh, rituals to this day. Four main variations of these calendars exist with uh, New Year's Day falling on, for example, sun's entry into constellation Aries, which happens around April 14th. Uh, this is also the New Year Day in several Southeast Asian countries like Laos, Th Thailand, and Burma. Second kind is the one where the New Year's Day occurs on the spring equinox, which occurs around March 20th. And the third kind 
with the spring new moon after the equinox as the New Year's Day that occurs sometime in March, April. This year it occurred uh, around April 12th, early this week. And the fourth kind is the with um, fourth kind is the one with uh, New Year's Day falling on one of the autumn new moons, which occurs either in October or November. <clears throat> As shown in these pictures on the right, people from different regions celebrate the new year with a lot of pomp, with uh, food and celebrations. And the picture on the top left, this one, is a festive dish eaten on the New Year's Day in the region where I grew up. It contains a mix of six different tastes made with local ingredients and represents that life is a mixture of uh, happiness, surprise, sadness, anger, disgust, and fear. It is reminded that even in the midst of uh, bitter experiences, there are sweet moments and one has to learn to put pain and pleasure in proper perspective. So a belated happy new year to you all. Let me jump into the topic by traveling back a few thousand years into the past. Archaeological evidence uh, shows that early civilizations arose in the regions so shown on this map. And all of them were associated with the uh, major rivers as uh, one would expect. Origins of the Western astronomy that uh, we usually <clears throat> talk about in VBAS with all the constellation and stories can be traced back to uh, Mesopotamia. By knowing how sophisticated a civilization's astronomical work is, it is possible to determine its uh, general intellectual and uh, socio-cultural level. Is there a question? Okay, I'll focus on uh, astronomy of the Eastern civilizations. These two civilizations combinedly have a history of 10,000 years and uh, changed a lot over the years. Even though the years of transition geographically and culturally, some stories developed during the very early ages of these civilizations still survive in one form or other. What I'm going to share with you in the next 30 or so minutes are it's just uh, barely scratching the surface of uh, what is all out there. All right, let's uh, talk about astronomy in India. Let's uh, start with uh, our closest star, the sun. Here are some portrayals of the sun god in India. The one on the right shows a uh, sun god riding a chariot pulled by seven horses, representing seven days. And uh, there are several other figurines which can be interpreted as uh, <clears throat> goddess of the dawn, goddess of light and knowledge. Here is a temple dedicated to the sun god that was built around uh, 800 years ago. The structure has appearance of a 100 foot chariot with immense wheels on the sides that is pulled by horses. I grew up uh, in a small town in Southern India in the 90s, few hundred miles from uh, the city where this sun temple is located on the eastern coast of uh, India. During the, this is where, this is Mark, where I grew up. And uh, during the holidays, I used to visit my grandparents or the extended family who lived in villages. As there were no internet or cable and sometimes no electricity, all kinds of, uh, all the kids used to just play outdoors. And uh, summers were so hot that uh, we used to sleep outdoors under like uh, night sky, sometimes clear. Uh, my great grandmother used it to tell us bedtime stories related to constellations or uh, local folklore. As we played during the day, one thing caught my observation. Every day my grandmother used to step outside the home several times in the morning to look at the sky to see if the sun was visible or not. Out of curiosity, I asked her one day why she was uh, doing it. And she said she had to see the sun to have her first meal of the day. On a cloudy day, she would end the fast in the evening after sun went down and had her dinner as the first and only meal for the day. 
she did this while preparing breakfast and lunch for all of us and doing all the other house chores. I asked her why she was so adamant about seeing the son to have her first meal of the day. And her response was that because son is the Supreme God. Uh, at that age, it was too abstract of a concept for me to understand. But I, as I learned more and more about the importance of the sun to the existence of uh, life on earth, I understand why cultures across the space and time worship the solar deity for millennia. As you can see here, Egyptians, Greeks, uh, Chinese, um, early Christian history, and Mesoamericans and Buddhists all have a solar deity. Exposure to these rituals and star lore at early age influenced my interest in astronomy and by extension in the field of science and engineering. And when I immigrated to United States uh, for doing my PhD, my research was in nuclear fusion in a, in a crude way that's uh, like creating the artificial star or the sun on earth. Let's uh, look at what ancient uh, Indians knew about astronomy. The Indus Valley civilization that existed three to 5,000 years ago, extended from parts of uh, uh, present day Afghanistan to present day India. This was a very advanced civilization for its time with uh, well-planned cities. Archeologists are also still figuring out the Indus script so very little was known about this civilization. Thousands of uh, stone carved seals were uh, discovered in this area by archeologists. Uh, this civilization likely ended due to climate change uh, and migration. Here is uh, one of those thousand seals discovered about hundred years ago. It's about the size of a square with the one and a half inch sides. Let me overlay a drawing so that you can see the details better. Seal uh, shows a deity with a horned headdress and uh, looking down on a kneeling uh, worshiper, a giant ram and uh, seven figures in procession complete the narrative. The figures were a single headdress and long skirts. A couple of interpretations of this seal exist. One is that the deity here is the Hindu god uh, Skanda, who is the god of war and victory. And the seven figures at the bottom are the seven stars in the star cluster Pleiades, who are the wet nurses of the infant god Skanda. Indian name of this star cluster is uh, Kritika, hence the name of the Skanda, there is also the name of Skanda, which is Kartikeya. The Pleiades are uh, said to be the wives of uh, seven sages who are identified with the seven stars of the great bear, which uh, we will talk about in a little bit. Pleiades is a very prominent star cluster and is uh, easily visible with the naked eye in the constellation Taurus. The Japanese name for this star cluster is Subaru. If you drive a Subaru, Take a look at that logo and see if you can understand the reason behind the logo design. The second interpretation is that it represents the celebration of a new year uh, at um, 3104 BCE. The figure in between the branches of the tree is thought to be the god of fire. The seven figures at the bottom of the seal are thought to be the alignment of uh, five naked eye planets plus the sun and the moon on uh, 7th February 3014 BC. Here is uh, another seal broken. Let me overlay that drawing. <clears throat> the central figure is supposed to be three-faced uh, god Prajapati Brahma, it's the lord of civil war sorry, civil here, which starts at the autumnal equinox. The animal, animal motifs are to represent, you see these four animals. 
these animal motifs start to represent various uh, constellations at the time of uh, equinoxes and solstices. The autumn equinox is uh, represented by elephant, now represented by Scorpio. The vernal equinox is represented by buffalo, now represented by Taurus, the bull. The summer solstice by the tiger, now represented by Leo. And the winter solstice by rhino or boar, represented by star formula. Another representation is this is actually a four, four headed uh, uh, Lord Brahma, who is the creator of the universe. The head uh, in the back is not visible. And these four animals are kind of uh, protecting four directions of the earth. In Indian, the word is Dikpalaka. They are the responsible entities for that direction. Let's look at what uh, ancient texts uh, tell us about uh, the planets. One can find lots of uh, references to Navagraha in ancient texts. Nava means nine and uh, Graha means a planet or a celestial body. Current uh, day usage or the translation of planet is Graha, but Graha can be any celestial body. It is a common sight in Hindu temples to see idols of these nine celestial bodies. One such uh, sculpture from San Diego Museum is shown here. These nine celestial bodies are uh, not the same as the nine planets that uh, we all learned in science. Uh, of course, now it is eight planets because we are mean, we are mean to the planet Pluto and uh, we demoted it, which is very mean of us. So that's not fair to Pluto. From left to right, these uh, celestial bodies are the sun, moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn. These last two, you might be wondering what those last two the name, Indian names are given on the left side here. Last two are Rahu and Ketu. So let me tell you the story to explain the origins of these two celestial bodies. The name of the story is a churning of the ocean of milk. It is uh, one of the best known episodes in the Indian philosophy and forms the central events in the ever continuing struggle between the gods and demons. It is a very long story with lessons about collaborations, patience, diplomacy, trickery, sacrifice, and so on and so on. I'll try to shorten the story. Due to some circumstances, the gods had become weakened as a result of a curse by a sage. Gods wanted to get their strength back, so they invited the demons to help them recover the elixir of immortality by churning the ocean of milk. They used a big mountain as the churning rod. And in order to prevent the mountain from sinking into the ocean, they used a, the back of a giant, giant tortoise as the platform. They used a giant snake to, as the churning rope. Guards were on one side, demons on the other. The churning brought up some wonderful treasures from the depths of the ocean, such as the moon, Herbal plants, useful weapons, gems, and so on and so on. Some good, some not so good items. Gods and demons shared all these among themselves. The final or the supreme treasure that uh, they actually wanted was uh, finally came out. That's the elixir of immortality. Neither group wanted to share it with the other. So a fighting ensued. Guards used various tricks to distract the demons and successfully took the elixir and uh, started distributing it among themselves. One of the demons disguised as guard and put some of the elixir in his mouth. Both the sun and moon guards noticed this disguise and informed one of the Hindu trinity, Vishnu, the preserver of the universe about it. Vishnu then cut off the head of this demon before the elixir could pass down his throat. The story ends with the rejuvenated gods uh, defeating the demons. Multiple versions of this story exist across various uh, Southeast Asian cultures. 
here is a depiction of the story at uh, Bangkok Airport, Thailand. If you are ever at uh, Bangkok Airport, I highly recommend you check this out. This is a very big, huge, life-size <clears throat> portrayal of the uh, event. Okay, let's uh, go back to the poor demon whose head was uh, cut off. Since his body touched the elixir, he didn't die. But at the same time, he couldn't become whole again. So his head and body are still up in the sky, roaming around uh, the cosmos. So technically, both his body and head qualify to be called celestial bodies. It may not meet the definition of uh, International Astronomical Union, or IAU, but uh, IAU didn't exist at the time of this legend. So we are good to call the head and body as celestial bodies. Since sun and moon gods snitched on him, the demons uh, head and body keep chasing them and uh, once in a while succeed in catching sun and moon. So those are the eclipses. That's uh, so the eighth celestial body, the Rahu, lives at the ascending node of the moon and the ninth celestial body lives at the descending node. So the eclipse, uh, <clears throat> eclipse, eclipse uh, occurs on the ascending node, they call Rahu kind of uh, gobbled up the moon. Or uh, if it is other side, it's a Ketu. Let's move to the one of the prominent asterisms called uh, Big Dipper in constellation or some major, also known as uh, Big Bear or Mama Bear. Big Dipper forms the tail of the bear Yes, bears grow tails when they go to space. The last two stars in the dipper are used to find the North Star or Polaris. Polaris is at the tip of the tail of uh, Ursa Minor, also known as small bear or baby bear. If you take a time lapse of uh, night sky centered at the pole star or Polaris, you can see that all the stars rotate around Polaris. Various versions of uh, star lore exist in India about Big Dipper. Big Dipper is called uh, Saptarishi, which translates to seven sages or seven learned ones. They learned about cosmos and the world and gained that knowledge by going around the sky. The seven wet nurses that I talked about a couple of slides ago, uh, who are Pleiades or Pritika, are said to be the wives of uh, these uh, seven sages. The names of these sages next to the stars are written in this uh, image here. Various Indian tribes have uh, various stories about the Big Dipper. There is a tribe that lives in my grandparents' village and uh, their version is that the four stars in the dipper represent an old lady's card and uh, three stars in the tail of the handle of the dipper are the three thieves trying to steal it. And we definitely don't want uh, somebody stealing the uh, old lady's card. The hell will break loose. So the old lady can never go to sleep as she has to protect her card. And uh, this indirectly suggests that the Big Dipper never sets. It just goes around the Polaris and stays up all the time. Of course, based on your location. But that's the real story from the tribes of that region passed on for generations. The second star in the handle of the Dipper is uh, Mizar. If you look closely, you can actually see a fainter companion star next to it called Alkor. The name Alkor comes from Arabic and it means either forgotten or neglected one. It's very faint. Native Americans used Alkor as an, uh, as an eye test. And um, next time when you see the Big Dipper, test your eyesight by trying to find Alkor. You know, in fact, Mizor is actually four stars and Alcor is a double star. So even though they appear as two different stars, actually there are six stars there. The 
in India, Mizar is known as Vashishta, as, as uh, shown here, one of the seven stages, seven sages, and Arkar is uh, Arundhati, wife of uh, Vashishta. They are inseparable couple and they travel the cosmos together to this day. One of the rituals performed at uh, some Hindu weddings is that after the exchange of vows, priest takes the bride and groom out and points them to these two stars, indicating that the bride and groom need to live together forever, no matter how many hardships they face in their relationship. My parents said they performed this ritual at their wedding. They have been uh, married for four, more than 40 years and it seems like it's working so far. But that's uh, only one data point, so I can't test this hypothesis. <clears throat> Moreover, my dad doesn't remember seeing the stars, but uh, since my mom said she saw them, he doesn't want to challenge her uh, and uh, ruin his uh, post-retirement life that he's enjoying now. Maybe there are other ways to have a long marriage in addition to looking at the stars. Since we are in the next to Polaris, the Indian name uh, for Polaris is Dhruva. There is a kid story about uh, Polaris or Dhruva that teaches them about uh, perseverance and uh, fruits of uh, hard work. Dhruva is uh, the son of a king and king has uh, <clears throat> two wives. Dhruva is the son of king's first wife. The king has another son from his second and uh, favorite wife. Dhruva is not treated well and feels disappointed all the time. He asks his mom, who is greater than a king? And she responds by saying that Vishnu, who is uh, the, one of the Hindu trinity and is responsible for uh, preserving of the universe, is greater than king. And Dhruva asks her, where does Vishnu live? And she says, high up in the mountains. So Dhruva travels into the mountains to seek out Vishnu. And uh, he keeps climbing, keeps climbing, even though he faces uh, lots of challenges, he keeps climbing until he reaches the northern point in the sky. He then meditates without food and drink for months. And uh, he finally hears from Vishnu. And uh, when, asked why Vishnu, when asked by Vishnu what he wanted, Dhruva asks uh, to be remembered for eternity. Pleased with this, Vishnu puts Dhruva at the northernmost location away from any evil. So that's how <clears throat> Dhruva star or the Polaris uh, uh, attained its position. Right Here in the uh, US, a lot of people connect uh, to the idea of man on the moon. I grew up listening to rabbit on the moon. So even now, when I look at the moon, the first thing that comes to my mind is the rabbit. It is really hard for me to see the man on the moon. I have to look it up on the uh, internet to kind of make the man on the moon impression when I see the moon. So people from various regions uh, saw various things like uh, a man, woman, rabbit, toad, crab, etc. on the moon. One of the stories from early Buddhist literature from India about uh, 300 BCE talks about how the rabbit uh, reached the moon. One day Buddha decided to test uh, three friends, monkey, fox, and rabbit. So he disguised himself as a hungry old man and uh, asked these three animals for help. The monkey brought him mangoes and the fox brought him fish. But as the rabbit ate only grass, it had uh, nothing to offer the man but uh, himself. So the rabbit had the monkey and fox help him build a fire, promising to give its uh, cooked flesh to the old man to eat. However, before the rabbit uh, could leap into the fire, Buddha revealed himself having been impressed by rabbit's uh, generosity. To remind everyone of the rabbit's generosity, Buddha took rabbit to the moon to shine brightly forever. Uh, let me <clears throat> end the part of the talk uh, related to India by talking about one of the major contributors to the field of uh, mathematics and astronomy, um, Aryabhata. 
He lived about uh, 1500 years ago. He wrote multiple books on mathematics that involved algebra and trigonometry. His works were influenced by the, uh, that of Greeks at the time. Greek civilization was thriving at the time, a very, very advanced civilization at the time compared to other civilizations. And Aryabhata was one of the first ones to propose the idea of uh, relative motion between two objects. It's so easy for us now, but not so easy at that time. <laughs> Later on, uh, his works had great influence on the works of various uh, Islamic scholars that lived during the Islamic golden age. And one particular episode of uh, the new Cosmos series talks about the golden age of Islam. So if you haven't watched that, I highly recommend that. For his contributions, Aribata was uh, honored in various ways. India's uh, first uh, satellite launched in 1975 was uh, named after him. A remnant of uh, impact crater on the moon is also named after him. And uh, quite interestingly, a species of uh, a bacteria that is found only in the stratosphere is also named after him. All right, let's... Uh, spend the uh, next half of the talk about astronomy in China. <clears throat> Chinese myths and uh, legends around stars, planets, and uh, constellations dates back to the second millennium BCE. Uh, this is during uh, the Chinese Bronze Age and the Shang Dynasty. You can see a calendar carved onto a turtle shell that's uh, dated for about 2000 BCE. There are uh, extensive records of astronomical tables, calendars, eclipses, and comets that uh, they observed. Some predictions brought prizes to the priests, and some didn't end well for them, as it happened to one such priest in 20, 2134 BCE for failing to predict the eclipse. They developed various mathematical techniques to record and predict the location of the sun, moon, and planets. One of the biggest inventions is the armillary sphere. And that needs a lot of uh, attention to details and uh, recording of uh, locations of the stars and planets. Most of the work was destroyed in uh, 206 uh, BC by emperor at the time because uh, probably that work contradicted their beliefs at the time. So ancient uh, Chinese astronomers divided the sky into four regions, collectively known as uh, four symbols. Each assigned a mysterious animal. There are dragon on the east, tortoise on the north, tiger on the west, and bird on the south. Each region contains seven mansions, uh, making a total of seven times 428 mansions. These mansions uh, correspond to the longitudes along the ecliptic uh, that the moon crosses. Again, Chinese used the lunisolar calendar. So most of their readings are about uh, moon phases. So these uh, mansions correspond to the uh, longitudes along the ecliptic that the moon crosses during its uh, 27 or so day journey around the earth and serve as a way to track the moon's progress. In Taoism, they are called 28 Chinese generals. So these 28 mansions are equivalent to, let's say, the zodiacal constellations in the Western astronomy. Coincidentally, uh, Indian astronomers also divided, early Indian astronomers also divided the sky into 28 uh, lunar mansions also called nakshatras. But if you divide in the sky 360 degrees by 28, that results in an odd number. Um, so not odd in the sense, uh, even and odd. It's a very uh, kind of weird uh, fraction, 360 divided by 28. Um, so the latter versions of uh, Indian uh, calendar or Indian mansions, lunar mansions only mentioned 27, so that uh, 360 divided by 27 results in about 13 and 
13 degree 20 minutes of the portion of the sky. So it's a little, little bit cleaner portion of the sky. Coming back to the four symbols, uh, the dragon is associated with spring, consists of uh, stars in the modern const constellations of Virgo, Libra, Scorpion, and uh, Sagittarius. The dragon's heart was uh, represented by what the Chinese call the five star, the modern Antares, one of the biggest, uh, uh, largest stars. The bird is associated with summer and consists of stars in the constellation Gemini, Cancer, Hydra, and uh, Corvus the crow. And the tiger is associated with autumn and consists of stars in the present day Andromeda, Pisces, Taurus, and Orion, as you can see <coughs> here, Taurus. Tota is, is associated with winter and consists of uh, um, stars in Capricornus, Aquarius, and Pegasus. A tomb excavated in 1987 was uh, in China was uh, dated back to about uh, 4000 BCE and it contained uh, two mosaics formed from white clam shells interpreted as a tiger and a dragon. Right, before I show one of the fascinating discoveries of uh, archaeo astronomy, let me talk a little bit about uh, the place where that discovery happened. Around 4th century CE, a Buddhist monk was uh, wandering through the Dunhang located around the Silk Road to find a place somewhere to somewhere quiet so that uh, he can uh, meditate and contemplate. He found a nice location and uh, dug a cave to meditate and live there. Over time, several mo other monks joined him and over the next thousand or so years, the number of craves grew and this place became prominent uh, Buddhist uh, center. The caves contain some of the finest examples of uh, Buddhist art spanning a period of thousand years. There is an estimated uh, half a million square feet of uh, religious uh, wall murals within these caves. When the Silk Road was finally aband abandoned around the uh, 14th or 15th century, Dinhuang slowly became depopulated and largely forgotten by the outside world. Most of the caves were abandoned too. So in the year 1900, just by accident, one monk wanted to restore the statues in the cave. When he was uh, restoring one of the big caves, he happened to, he happened upon a door on the side of a wall, as shown in this picture on the bottom uh, left. When they opened that door and went into the side chamber, they found a room full of uh, manuscripts. Of course, the word spread to archaeologists working in uh, British India at the time. And uh, one of them traveled to Dunhuang to look at these manuscripts. He immediately realized how unique and important these uh, manuscripts were. Some of these are uh, preserved at a British museum. One such unique manuscript is the star chart. The chart measures uh, 11 feet by 9 inches and is uh, considered the earliest known atlas of the night sky. It shows about 1300 stars visible to the naked eye and uh, 257 asterisms, all of them accurately plotted using a projection similar to that of uh, Mercator projection, which is uh, widely used in <clears throat> maps. And the note that uh, Mercator projection was uh, very advanced uh, and developed in about 16th century. And uh, these people actually used some projection similar to Mercator projection long ago. The night sky is divided into 12 segments, as you can see here on this. And the final chart, this one, shows the North Polar region straight up and the scroll ends with uh, the depiction of an archer thought to represent the god of lightning. You can see the outline of constellation Orion in the 
panel three from the left on the top picture. It was tough to determine the age of the charts. Uh, best estimate was that the charts were developed uh, in seventh century C. So regarding that uh, final chart that shows the polar region, um, uh, the only clearly recognizable pattern here is what we call the Big Dipper. We talked about it a few minutes ago, the seven sages. In the Chinese tradition, sky was a mirror of the Chinese emperor, or the empire, sorry. The emperor was at the center and uh, a stationary point around which all stars rotate the North Pole. And from that point outward, we have the entire court of the emperor, the two lines of stars, one in the front and one in the back, represent walls of the forbidden city, the imperial city where the emperor lived. And these four stars here, one, two, three, four, right next to the center are the four advisors to the emperor called Sifu. Big Dipper is the emperor's chariot parked right outside the fort and uh, empire is to step into the chariot and uh, travel across the sky every day. So this is an engraving dated to the Eastern Han Dynasty, uh, shows the Big Dipper, you see it. So Big Dipper, including actually the double star system, Alcor and Major here. And you see the emperor sitting in the chariot going around the sky. When it comes to cosmology, um, there are three major theories of cosmology over the course of uh, Chinese history. The first viewed the heavens as a kind of great canopy or power and originated around the uh, 12th century BC. The second proposed by Zhang Heng compared to the cosmos to an egg with the earth at the center. There is a parallel in the Indian version also called Brahman. So that's uh, and means egg and Brahm means universe. The third saw heavenly bodies floating in space. Comets have been observed and recorded in uh, China for more than 3000 years. And uh, they also pointed out that comets tail always points away from the sun independent of whether the comet is moving towards or away from the sun. Well, now we know the reason for that um, because of the solar wind and so on, but uh, it would have bothered them tremendously why the tail is always pointing away from the sun. Uh, they observed the comets so much that uh, they recorded several versions of the tail's characteristics and uh, color of the core. The first ever recorded appearance of the comet Hal Halle was uh, made in China uh, almost 2200 years ago. Uh, ancient Chinese also recorded sunspots and uh, thought those as parts of uh, sun being eaten away. Uh, the earliest verified recorded solar eclipse also belongs to the Chinese astronomers. Predicting the eclipses was a big deal, of course, with uh, that's the same with <clears throat> any culture, including Native American cultures. Uh, solar eclipses were considered omens of uh, either good or evil. If the emperor could predict the occurrence of an eclipse, he could uh, then turn it into a positive prediction and uh, strengthen his power with the people. He could show that he was the link between the heavens and the people on earth. Uh, rivals for power would use the eclipse as a sign that uh, they could overthrow the emperor who had lost the uh, mandate of uh, heavens. Right, so Milky Way is our home galaxy. Uh, the Chinese name for the Milky Way translates to celestial river or river of heaven. The Milky Way is part of one of uh, China's most popular myth the tale of the cowherd and the weaver girl. 
the Weaver girl is the granddaughter of the celestial emperor. Weaver girl is Star Vega. She falls in love with the cow herd represented by Star Altair. The celestial emperor in, did not approve of this relationship and ordered the couple to be separated by a celestial river, that is the Milky Way. They were only allowed to meet once a year on the seventh day of the seventh lunar month. The magpies would uh, spread their wings together to form a bridge across the celestial river, enabling the tragic lovers in heaven to meet that night. The earliest known reference to this famous myth uh, dates, dates back to <clears throat> over uh, 2,500 years ago. To this day, the Chinese version of the Valentine's Day is celebrated on the seventh day of uh, the seventh uh, lunisolar month on the Chinese calendar. All right, let me end the part of uh, talk related to uh, China by talking about a Chinese scholar named uh, Zhan Heng. In the second century CE, he was appointed as the chief astronomer for the Han court. His major contributions to the field of astronomy include uh, cataloging about uh, 2,500 stars, predicting eclipses, and uh, providing explanation for why eclipses happen. He has also described the Earth as round, quite a revolutionary for that time period to say that the Earth is round. And he also explained that the moonlight is a reflection from the sun. Some inventions of uh, Jan Hang included he updated the existing armillary sphere by mapping uh, over 2000 stars and uh, making it uh, run by water and uh, several complex uh, gear mechanisms. And uh, there is also a seismometer that uh, he invented. It's, it's an arm with some type of pendulum apparatus contained within it. Uh, we don't know the exact mechanics because they were lost in history. This is just a model showing just outside. <clears throat> the pendulum was extremely sensitive to vibration. When it swung it, it released a ball from the mouth of uh, one of the eight dragons and the ball fell into the mouth of uh, this patiently waiting frog. The loud clang that resulted notified the attendants of uh, some sort of uh, seismological event. It is said that uh, one day the ball fell, but uh, people in the court didn't uh, feel anything. But a few days later, a runner arrived from a village 400 miles away to inform the emperor that uh, his area had been devastated by an earthquake. While Zhang Heng's uh, seismic graph uh, couldn't uh, predict a quake, uh, it could notify the court when one occurred so that uh, aid could be sent to that region. Right. So for his contributions, Jiang Heng was uh, honored in multiple ways, including uh, uh, naming of a crater on the far side of the moon and uh, an asteroid <clears throat> about the size of uh, 13 kilometers discovered in 1964. Here are my uh, sources. So that's uh, where I end my talk. Thank you. Thanks again for joining. If uh, you have heard some interesting stories about uh, the constellations or star lore, either from your culture, your history, or you just heard it uh, when you visited some place, uh, feel free to share it with us. Uh, here is uh, our uh, email address. With that, I'll end my talk. Back to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Naveen. Uh, that was an amazing talk. Diz, <laughs> thanks Chuck, for the for the claps. I'll cl it's hard to clap over. I have a cat in my lap. Um, does anybody have any questions for Naveen? You can post them either in the chat or you can unmute and go ahead and. Yes, I have a question. Sure, go for it. Oh, what sort of instruments did uh, the did the uh... Did the people of uh, ancient India and China have for um, for astronomy, for plotting the location of stars and also viewing sunspots? That's another one. Um, I'm pretty sure they didn't do that by their naked eye. Yeah, so I I can prepare a completely 
like one hour long talk on that while uh, researching these, what are the instruments, like water clocks, they use water clocks to accurately measure the time. And uh, there are a lot of uh, structures um, in India that they found to kind of uh, uh, see, to align with the equinoxes and solstices and all that. Um, accurately measuring time, I can go into details, uh, like the time measurement system for Indians is really, really complex. They measure times uh, of the order of like uh, millions, billions of years to uh, something like uh, the second, a, a scale of second, just uh, with the, the eye flop. Um, instruments wise, of course, uh, something like sundial and uh, there are uh, big uh, um, kind of structures that show the sun's movement. So it's like many other cultures that you find in uh, even in Mesoamerica, um, there is this big temple in Cambodia called Angkor Wat. It has, it has uh, three big domes and the domes were constructed in such a way so that sun is aligned on like uh, the solstice with one of the dome and uh, on the on equinoxes on one of the days. Regarding sunspots for uh, uh, China, I am not an expert on that, so I don't know the answer to that. But I know even during the now, you can actually see a sunspot with a naked eye using a, uh, the reflection. If Miji is here, I don't know if Miji is in, in the crowd. She has this uh, kind of uh, instrument. I, I forgot the name of that. Probably somebody from VBAS or somebody other uh, expert from astronomy can answer that. It's, it's just this, this big and you can actually set it up and uh, kind of align the sunlight into it and you can actually see the spots. Who, who asked that question? I can follow up with you and I can actually send you a picture of the instrument. That was crossover maniac. <laughs> okay. Um, there's another question we have from uh, Nishant. Uh, I'll, I'll hey. hey, sorry, Michael, go ahead. Well, oh, I can I just, I just I my email uh, in the chat if you want. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Michael. Hey, Naveen, uh, amazing talk. I just wanted to say uh, I'm from India. I, I do have a lot of interest in Indian mythology and astronomy myself, but obviously uh, it's not a hobby. So this, this was really helpful for me. I do want to just share something uh, of my own experience here, just because it's it's fun. Uh, so my uh, my own first astronomy. So when Naveen spoke about Rahu and Ketu, that these are like two demons that kind of cause a lunar eclipse and solar eclipse. Uh, lunar eclipse and solar eclipses are uh, considered very bad in India that you do not want to see them. But I was always excited as a kid and. You didn't believe that uh, when, when we had solar eclipses, uh, we, I followed most of the scientific ways, like we had X-ray films and we were told you could use those and watch them, or uh, you had to get solar uh, glasses and watch them. But um, a funny thing, um, when I was in my uh, high school, maybe uh, in my college, uh, where we stayed, uh, we had a person, uh, he, he was an old guy and he did, uh, he did a laundry for a living. So it was considered a very uh, hard manual job. And uh, he said, all he did was he just got a bowl. He filled the bowl with water and then he put it on the floor, on the ground. And he said, let's look, look in that water and you'll see the sun. And that was still now the best solar eclipse I saw because uh, it felt very simple. So uh, astronomy is something that has... Uh, being rooted in a lot of Indian and I mean, it's rooted across the whole world. So I think this, uh, yeah, I think this was a great talk. I did not expect uh, to be very interested with this. Uh, thanks everyone for organizing this. And thanks Naveen for this talk. Naveen, uh, by the way, I was uh, looking at what it was called. You were referring to a camera obscura, correct? Um, for yeah, the sunspots. Yeah. I've... It's a pinhole. Basically, it's a it's a singular pinhole, and then it'll it'll reflect um, the image of the sun. It's called a camera obscura. Exactly. And there um, is also a wooden one. Like Mitzi brings it to all the outreach events. I 
never bother to like check the name of the instrument. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. That's what it's called. Um, basically, it shows the image upside down, but for the sun, that doesn't really matter too much. Um, did anybody else have any questions for Naveen? Oh, there's one from John. Uh, what record survived the burning event in 200 BC? Well, I mean, um, he, the emperor, of course, couldn't get his hands on everything. So whatever his empire covered, I think uh, he pretty much burned a lot of that. So I don't know the exact details because probably no one knows because it's burned. And also that uh, crossover maniac put his email address in there. Yeah, for yeah, you. I, I, I took it down. Okay. Anybody else have any questions for Naveen? I'm probably um, <clears throat> going to invite you to give a talk at UNA about this subject when we do International Week uh, in the fall. So I'll warn you ahead of time. Yeah, Mel, I know this is the third time or so you are listening to some of these stories, right? <laughs> well, thanks for joining. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the invite. I'll be happy to um, do that. Okay. Oh, uh, there's, let's see. Tim sent me, I'm assuming, uh, Tim, did you want this as a question for the group or just for me? You can you can unmute your mic now if you want. Oh, the group. Okay. Uh, for Naveen, uh, are you familiar with any folklore that discuss star death? Star, star death. Death. I'm assuming that meaning like the the death of a yeah, like so a supernova. Yeah, kind of probably a supernova. Yeah, yeah, super. So of course, I mean, yes. Yeah, so. Um, Chinese observed the famous super, supernova of uh, 1050 uh, CE, so that's a famous one. Uh, there is uh, there is one that I found uh, from uh, the northern Indian state of uh, Kashmir, about uh, 3000 BCE. There is a rock painting showing uh, some kind of uh, very very bright object uh, outshining the moon. That's the interpretation. This is a rock art, 3000 BCE, and uh, there was one supernova at the time. So that's the only uh, recorded one art that I found in doing my research. Jared just sent me something. Uh, I was completely wrong about the camera obscura. He, uh, I believe Mitzi, Mitzi brings something called a sunspotter solar telescope. It's a wooden kind of like yeah, exactly. circular. That's what I was okay, mm -hmm. yeah, that's yeah. what that's what it meant. But the camera obscura works too. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, if not, um, I'm going to stop the recording here. Thank you once again, Naveen, for your presentation. Thank you everybody for showing up. We had a great turnout tonight. Um, next month we're going to be doing. Let's see, uh, is Rod is Rod here? Rod's still here? No, maybe? Uh, I'm, I'm still here. Cool. Rod's going to be talking about his experience building um, his own observatory. So a little bit less on the science of astronomy, more of the practical side. So uh, stay tuned next month for that. That's going to be for our annual meeting. No pressure, Rod, at all. Um, <laughs> but it'll be a very interesting talk. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, I'm, I mean, we can hang. Oh, how to view the recording? That's a good question. So I am going to most likely upload this to YouTube on our YouTube channel um, and post that information on uh, our social media as well. So I'm going to stop the recording now.